Hello and welcome back to Ask the Supervisor. I'm your host, Matt Lambs, and I am, of course, joined with East Hampton Town Supervisor Peter Van Skoyak. Today is Monday, July 18th. We are live from Town Hall, both of us, which is nice being back in person here. Uh, it's been a few weeks since we've done this, but how are you doing? I'm doing well, Matt. Yeah, it's Happy been summer. It was a great weekend. Um, today, not so great, but you can only do so much with Mother Nature. We, we, we need the rain, and I think it's coming a little later this evening. But uh, may miss. We're looking pretty dry. Yeah, so. we've had, yeah, it's been a little dry. Um, but you know what hasn't? Shark attacks. It's on the rise, and that's what I want to get into first because who doesn't love to talk about shark sightings? It's it's just it's thrilling. Um, of course, Jaws was sort of filmed out here with Steven Spielberg on the uh, water. But um, there has been a few shark attacks and sightings throughout the past few weeks in Long Island. None here, from is my understanding. None at our beaches. There has been whales and um, awesome dolphins to look at out here. But specifically, Smith Point County Park and Shirley had an attack. A lifeguard was bitten in the foot at Ocean Beach. Um, Fire Island lifeguard was bitten at Smith Point on July 3rd. And then finally, June 30th, had a swimmer's foot bitten at Jones Beach. Um, no one is seriously hurt. It's just stitches. And um, the two lifeguards, that it, it actually happened during training. Um, one was actually playing victim, which must have been terrifying because all of a sudden he needed to actually be saved. Um, but it's interesting. And while this is rare, it's an uptick in um, – at least sightings, not an uptick in attacks, really, because it's just a few little bites that happens every summer. But is it anything for residents here to be uh, worried about? Or what should someone do if they think they see a shark in the town? So, uh, you know, I think there is a heightened awareness, obviously, with uh, the shark bites recently. I think it was four attacks in yeah. a matter of 10 days. Um, that's not that's not typical Long Island. And uh, in fact, shark bites on Long Island are are not typical. Uh, it happens every once in a while mm -hmm. to have that many in a short span like that, you know, certainly is cause for concern and, and to wonder, you know, why is this happening now? Um, I think, you know, the awareness, like when, when they start throwing, sending up drones, you're going to see sharks cause they're in their natural habitat. That's where they live. And, uh, they have a really important purpose. Um, and keeping, keeping the ecosystems in balance. But I think where, you know, where people get into trouble, uh, I think the water is probably not quite as clear mm -hmm. further West that, as it is here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, has been a lot of bait in the water, which has attracted that's, the that's other marine heard, animals, yeah. you know, out here, we're, we're seeing many more whales and porpoises, uh, there's sea life and, and sharks. Um, but if you're splashing around in the water, you mentioned one of the lifeguards was in the process of, playing victim mm -hmm. and splashing around mm -hmm. and um, you know, sharks. And I think most of these sharks are smaller sharks. They think it's bait fish and they are, uh, you know, they're prone to attack schools of bait. Um, and that sort of is the same sort of uh, action sound and visual as, as a bait school being attacked. So um, you know, you can keep that in mind, you know, be aware of your surroundings mm -hmm. Uh, we're just visitors in the ocean. We, that's not our primary, you know, place of, uh, of living. And it, that is where the sharks live. So, um, I think if you were to send up drones and, and look along our coastline, you would probably see sharks, uh, as well as porpoises and whales. Um, but again, you know, just be aware of your surroundings. I don't think there's any imminent threat out here. Mm -hmm. The water is a bit clearer, mm -hmm. but, it, but on those days when it's a little bit, um, chopped up or a little, uh, a little dirty from wave action, um, you know, maybe be a little bit more aware. Uh, also, if you see schools, bait fish in the water, try to avoid swimming near them. Yeah. Is there a number or someone is, should someone call if they see a shark sighting or is that unnecessary? Should, I think if they're in a near a bathing beach that they should immediately report that to yeah. lifeguards yeah. and the lifeguards, uh, you know, do communicate with each other up and down the beach, uh, sightings are reported. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in some cases the guards here do have drones. Yeah. Um, and they will clear the beach if there's a sighting of a shark. I recall being at the beach, um, last summer and, uh, a fin was spotted just mm -hmm. beyond the breakers and 
people were, you know, pointing at it and getting out of the water. Um, I dove in the water and swam out to it because I knew that it wasn't a shark. I knew that it was the fin of a mola mola, an ocean sunfish, which is completely benign. You took a big risk there. No, I didn't actually. because <laughs> I knew what I was doing, but uh, this woman asked me afterwards, well, why did you do that? Why did you dive in and swim out when you saw the fin? I said, because I knew it wasn't a shark yeah. um, and explain what it was. Uh, it's nice to be able to see, you know, see life. Oh yeah. Um, it's a, I think it's an indication that the ecosystem's healthy. Um, and again, what's rare here is that people are being bitten. And again, I think it's the murkier water and the vast volume of people that are in the water where the fish are mm -hmm. normally feeding and they, it's confused identity. I think one mistaken identity, one Marine expert, uh, said it could be due to warmer water migration than is average of this time of year. And that could be why they're here a little earlier than sharks normally come. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not going to try to guess why there's extra sharks right now, but it's something to be aware of. And then um, just in case, for those at home, you do not go like this. If you need to be saved, you go like this. Anchor down. Because this looks like someone's having fun. This is means I need help. Interesting. And then if, I was he, unaware of if, if a lifeguard... Um, looks at you and you know kind of puts his arm at you or maybe he's trying to see if you need help if you don't need help you go like this so this needs saving this means i'm good this they're not going to answer to <laughs> I, I bet they would actually. no they probably would yeah, yeah yeah it's just the official i just want to make sure people know just in case um let's let's move on to the next topic today 16 arrests in a um, protest at the East Hampton Airport last week by the same group that protested in Southampton the previous weekend. Before that, um, their main protest is really at uh, Governor Hochul and really bigger uh, government about taxing the rich is how they put it. Do you have any statement from the town board over the, these arrests? And it, it kind of caused a lot on social media, but less in re the real world. Yeah. Yeah. One, I mean, one of our most fundamental rights as, as American citizens is the right to protest, peaceful protest mm -hmm. uh, to redress the government. Um, and it was a peaceful, peaceful protest. It did disrupt uh, traffic entering the parking lot. Mm -hmm. The police came uh, very quickly after the protesters set up to ensure that they weren't obstructing traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was peaceful. They did, um, did have to issue some arrests uh, to people who refused to move or comply with the uh, police orders. And, um, but, but they did so peacefully and did not resist arrest. Yeah. That was the, I think the purpose of, um, of the protest was to garner attention to their, um, their topic. And that's, you know, allowable. I thought our, our police handled, the situation very well. There was one individual who had propped themselves up on a very mm -hmm. tall homemade tripod. And, um, we actually had to get a bucket truck there in order to get that person down. Um, uh, and they were subsequently ar arrested. Um, uh, they held it but again. Yeah. Uh, no one was hurt and it was done in a, in a peaceful manner. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. And, and I, you know, commend uh, town staff and the police as well, who uh, were on scene to make sure that that was the case. And the, so I think they handled the situation very well. And then if there's any future unknown protests, is there any message you have for anyone who, again, they're allowed to do it, just don't block certain. Yes. And I mean, you know, if you're planning a protest, you can also uh, seek a permit for certain locations uh, or whatever to do that, to make sure that you know, everybody's aware and to make sure that you're not, you know, obstructing, uh, you may recall that, uh, there was, um, protests after George, uh, Floyd's yep. uh, murder, uh, right here in East Hampton, uh, that was, um, organized by a couple, um, young people within the community and they went through the permitting process and the road was closed for a period mm -hmm. of time, traffic diverted. It was, you know, organized and peaceful. And that's, you know, that's what we like to see. Cool. Uh, let's stay on the topic of the police, at least the East Hampton town. Um, a very awesome moment. Chelsea Tierney, who has been with the police department for quite some time now, has been promoted to lieutenant. 
with the East Hampton Police Department. She's the first female lieutenant in the 116-year history of the town police department. Tierney is highly respected and even turned down offers from the FBI and DEA after earning a master's um, degree from John Jay Community Sorry, John Jay College of Cr Criminal Justice. Tierney was the department's first female sergeant as well, being promoted in 2015. According to Tierney, women comprise about a fifth of the police department as of this year. Um, I just really wanted to get your general thoughts about this and kind of the progress of the East Hampton Police Department. Well, we're very proud and happy to have, uh, you know, Lieutenant Tierney on the force. And she's, you know, de demonstrated leadership uh, strong leadership capabilities. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy and pleased to have her on the force and, you know, she's worked her way up through the department, well-deserved promotions. And, uh, and, uh, we're just, we're happy to have her with us. I Do think it's a, you know, it's another example of, uh, you know, women continually to break down barriers of what, you know, traditionally have been considered male only positions. Um, you know, this is obviously another one for East Hampton town, you know, it's taken 106 years, you said, since the police department was originally organized mm -hmm. uh, to the point where we now have a lieutenant. I'm not sure, honestly, in the earlier days that they even had lieutenants or. Uh, I do have the history. I do have the history on that. I mean, yeah, the first I, women. I remember I remember looking through some of the town records um, from the 40s in 1940. Um, there was basically one constable <laughs> in town and. Uh, and he got paid $50 a month uh, for a gas allowance and I think $50 uh, for pay as well. So times have changed. Obviously, we have a great deal more officers now. We're much more popular location. The population's hugely different mm -hmm. than it would have been here in 1940. Uh, but I, I'm not the town historian. I'm not. Never will I try to be. But the first female police officer in the East Hampton Police Department was Tina Giles in 1985. We both know Tina yeah, know very Tina. well. Um, but she did it for 27 years. Um, she became the first detective. And then you had Officer Kim, who was a part of the D.A.R.E. program for thir Kim about Notel. Kim Notel for about recently retired. 30 years. Yeah, she just recently retired. Um, so they kind of paved the way for tyranny and all the different female police officers, and hopefully we'll only have more moving forward. Like you said, breaking down barriers. Um, Governor Hochul, as we go back to uh, more big scheme things here, Governor Hochul has passed legislation that requires new drivers to learn about pedestrian and bicyclist safety awareness as part of a component of the pre-licensing exam as a prerequisite for obtaining a license to operate a motor vehicle. That was a lot of words. <laughs> With two Tragic bicycle accidents, um, potentially uh, more incidents over the past weeks that resulted in deaths over the past few weeks. Is the town considering any changes on the roadway for safer bicycle conditions? Uh, yes, actually, we, we have been. And uh, one of the things that just today I was meeting with the Sagaponic Mayor um, Bill Tillotson mm -hmm. and Deputy Mayor uh, Thayer to talk about um, town line road specifically because that is a roadway that is shared between the two municipalities. Mm -hmm. You know, the east side is East Hampton, the west side is Sagaponic Village. And we talked about some traffic calming measures. I'll be discussing that at my liaison report tomorrow. Uh, one of the things is mm -hmm. uh, to consider is that with uh, our main arteries becoming clogged with traffic, mm -hmm. Many of the um, commuters have taken to back roads mm -hmm. and cut throughs through what used to be relatively quiet um, residential neighborhoods, and they're speeding to get to work. So, um, you know, we've talked about some traffic calming measures there, some additional stop signs at intersections and whatnot. Um, you know, this has been something that we've had concerns about for mm -hmm. some time. Under New York state law, towns are not allowed to have a speed limit lowered below 30 miles an hour, except in a school zone. Villages, on the other hand, um, are not limited. I didn't know that. To that. And we have, I think it's five times now since I've been on the board, we have lobbied the state legislature to get a home room rule message 
sponsored by Assemblyman Fred Thiel on all occasions, and it's failed to pass, uh, which would allow us to lower the speed limit on, on certain roads. Um, so with that not being an option, and a lot of people don't understand that, they say, well, why don't you just make it 20 miles an hour? Well, we're barred from, mm-hmm. under New York state law from doing that. Um, so there are other ways that we can address it. And in some cases, it could be increasing the width of roadways. So mm-hmm. There's a greater uh, safe shoulder area. Uh, we can also uh, put in additional stop signs at mm-hmm. intersections. It could be problematic. Uh, and obviously, enforcement's always a component of that as well. Um, and, you know, our police department has been increasing uh, patrols. You may have noticed and seen them out Um uh, setting up speed traps Mm -hmm. um, to remind people that, you know, the speed limits are uh, enforced and that there's a reason that we have speed limits. And it's, it's really for the safe conduct of of vehicles and pedestrians and bicycles on our roadways, which as you know, are quite narrow in many cases uh, and curvy and they weren't designed for the level of traffic that we have. Yep. So, um, People need to slow down and be aware of their surroundings. Don't mm-hmm. be distracted with your phone mm-hmm. uh, or with other things. Uh, drive defensively. Mm-hmm. You never know what's going to be around that next curve. Mm-hmm. Uh, chances are it's a bicyclist or a deer or a pedestrian, someone jogging, uh, or who knows what, you know. Uh, and that's, you know, something um, that personally bothers me a little bit is – people being unaware of their surroundings. Um, I, I really would hope people would be um, more cognizant of where they're walking and biking. You know, we both know there's a difference in bikers out here. There's the sport bikers who are all dressed up like the Tour de France, and then there's casual bikers. Um, but there's also people who walk strollers on windy roads and in foresty areas where there's blind turns and blind curves. And I really just want people to be aware of their surroundings. Uh, one follow-up question I do have is in part because of the increase in size out here, more cars, more people like to your point going on the back roads currently in New York state, only those 14 years or older, I mean, or younger need to wear a helmet legally when on a bike, could the town consider making everyone wear helmets regardless of age on top of that New York state law? Is that something we could consider? Because that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. If that's within the town's purview to Mm -hmm. have that type of regulation, um, certainly, you know, wearing a helmet is an important part of uh, bicycle safety because you can really severely injure yourself or even kill yourself just literally falling over sideways on your bike. You're out of position, can't get your hand down or yep. whatever, and you can hit your head hard on pavement mm-hmm. or any uh, anything else on the ground. So, um, you know, we do certainly encourage everyone. I honestly don't see many people riding bicycles out on the roadways that aren't wearing helmets. I've seen a but lot. But maybe you do. I see a lot and in my neighborhood. It, it might be different depending on the area yeah. that, that, you're, that you're talking about. I mean, maybe in some of the downtown areas of, uh, say, Montauk or whatever, mm-hmm. maybe you're not seeing cyclists wearing helmets. But, um, you know, the, I know the bike enthusiasts, mm-hmm. they all. Oh, they're pro it. helmet. Yeah. They're all, they're all wearing helmets pretty much. And, and most of the recreational bikers I see are wearing helmets. But in some areas, they may be. You know, I just want everyone to be safe is all, you know, I see certain situations where it's just, you think to yourself as a local, and this isn't from like a, you know, ego thing. This is from, I want everyone to be safe thing. You see people maybe walking on roads that necessarily aren't the safest. So so today we actually had a uh, dedication at Buckskill Park. Oh yes. Yes. um, And that was dedicating the recreational multi-use recreational path there. It's about six tenths of a mile. It's a large loop in a, in a 25 acre preserve mm-hmm. called the Trenzo preserve off Buckskill. And it was dedicated today to uh, Zachary Cohen. Yep. Zach was a bicycle enthusiast. He was um, a competitive cyclist at one point in his life. He um, passed away last year, un- unfortunately, sadly at age 70, I guess. He was involved in every aspect of, of, uh, of the town of East Hampton, yeah. uh, very big heart and community member. And he had worked as the chair of the town, pre- uh, 
Nature Preserve Committee. Oh, awesome. Yeah. For I think 14 years. Wow. And was on the committee for almost 20, I think. Wow. Um, but one of the things that he championed was safer bicycle routes and, okay. um, and specifically as chair of the Nature Preserve Committee, developing multi use recreational pathways uh, on some of our, our parks and preserves. We're also currently looking to, um, to accomplish that as well at Boys and Girls Harbor, which oh, nice. is off, yeah, of, yeah. Um, off of the harbor there on the west side. Uh, 57 acre preserve there. There's a, oh, wow. yeah. there's a, um, a pavilion planned with restrooms near oh, the, nice. near the yeah. roadway. Yeah. And then there's a very large property there, um, which kind of brings me up to what we're doing tomorrow at the work session. We'll have a discussion of emergency preparedness okay. with our emergency preparedness director, uh, Bruce Bates. Um, again, just kind of going over uh, preparations for hurricane season and what people should, uh, you know, keep in mind, remember, mm -hmm. be prepared, be proactive. Uh, so you're not running around, you know, a day or two before a storm is imminent, trying to find batteries or whatever yeah. else you might need, uh, to, to be prepared for that. Um, we'll also have a discussion and update of the 2022 capital plan yep. projects, uh, of which that boys and girls Harbor, a pavilion will be added to that list of things to discuss, but it's, uh, I mean, it also includes, um, Springs library, uh, roof replacement. That's an ongoing project. The Montauk skate park improvements mm -hmm. that's turning into a really fantastic uh, project. Things, it's, yeah. it's really going to be an exceptional skate park. Uh, we're working on the commercial fishing dock in fantastic. Star Island. It's, it's quite a long list yeah. of projects that are underway and are planned at various stages. So we'll do an update on that. Uh, and then we'll have um, a discussion of the revision to chapter 91, mm -hmm. which is beaches and parks. That particular section of code is um, takes the authority of both the, the trustees and town board in order to change um, that, that section of code. Um, what's really driving our look at revisions is to further clarify areas in town that are authorized by the town's beach driving permit. And this stems from the CVU case that's 4,000 feet on Epig, mm -hmm. uh, where a judge has um, issued a restraining order and found the town in contempt. And mm -hmm. so to become completely clear about, um, you know, what is, uh, what is the judge's order and what the rules are, we're making a small modification in that law just to doubly uh, make clear what areas that the, that the town's permit does not purport mm. to allow, um, or permit driving on private property. That's only on town or trustee beaches. Um, uh, seems pretty straightforward, but I yeah. guess we have to really overemphasize it, um, in that particular case. And, um, you know, we, you mentioned the community housing oh, yeah. fund, uh, and the, the draft, um, language for the proposition. We will discuss that. I, I don't think there were any other final uh, changes other than those, yeah. those comments that were made last week by town board members, a few little modifications that'll be circulated and discussed. And we'll have a uh, plan to have that on for adoption on the uh, Thursday meeting. Cool. Looking forward to seeing that. Um, just two more topics here to get through uh, very quickly. Uh, I just want to get your thought on this, really. Governor Hochul also passed legislation the other day requiring schools to consider using silent alarms in case of an emergency, really meaning school shootings. But do you think that our schools should consider this, using silent alarms? So, uh, you know, that's – that's a realm that uh, I, I leave up to the yeah. local school boards and whatnot for the most part as to how, how they handle um, and that they're much more adept than, and uh, familiar with what yeah. the requirements are for schools. But um, I mean, I, I, I think what I would say about this is um, it, it really is unbelievable that we are talking about silent alarms, fortifying schools, uh, turning them into almost like prisons to make sure nobody can come and go and, and 
and, uh, and, and harm school children, that that is the response uh, to fortify rather than address the root yeah. issue. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's very troubling that um, children are exposed to this. Yeah. And I, um, that this is the, this is the response. I think there are better responses to really drive at the root of what's causing the violence and uh, deal with that directly rather than be reactive and feel like we, we're not safe to, you know, go, uh, go, go to school. I yeah. mean, of all the places uh, that people should feel safe, it's, it's in our schools. Perfectly stated. Um, finally, the last topic while we have about two minutes here, vandals have been striking the local beach bathrooms once again. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's been ditch planes down at Albert's, um, f- maybe one other place that I forgot to type in here, but according, um, to councilman David lease, it cost roughly $4,000 to fix ditch planes last summer. So that's kind of what, that's kind of the number they're looking at. Um, is the town planning on putting security systems, unfortunately, to do, to, to do something about this? I'm not going to discuss the specifics of, of what we're doing. Uh, but I would say that, um, whoever's out there doing this, that we're going to find out who you are and you're going to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And, uh, you know, there is a significant amount of expense, not to mention inconvenience. I mean, I, I don't understand, frankly, the mentality of a person who, who goes in and destroys bathroom stalls. I mean, you know, this is a public bathroom. This is, uh, this is not just for the convenience of, of the public, but, you know, it's for public health. And, um, you know, we're trying to provide uh, facilities for public health and uh, somebody's going around and just uh, smashing things up. Uh, you, need, you need some help. We'd like to know who you are. We'd like to help you. Yeah. Um, this is not how you, you know, uh, conduct yourself in a civil society. And, um, you know, it's just, it's really unfortunate. Somebody thinks, you know, for whatever, no, yeah, this, is, this is fun. It's sad or whatever. It, yeah. it is really sad. So, um, you know, I, I'm frustrated by it. This yeah. is something that's gone on for some time. Um, I don't know if it's some adolescent rite of passage or what, but, you know, we've gone from having uh, porcelain mm-hmm. toilets with uh, seats to uh, stainless steel prison toilets with no seats, yep. you know, and um, you know, people have complained about that and you know, the response is, well, this is the only way we can keep the toilet. You also can't function. You, you can't, you know, it's not like you could have a key where the lifeguard has to give a key back and forth every single time. That's not right. their job. They have to right. pay it's attention like to the water. It's camera inside. No, the, I, I mean, the yeah. It's so. either to see who's, who's doing I'm it. I'm with but, you. But, uh, you know, that's, that's something we are working to address. I apologize for ending on a sadder note, but I did want to get that covered just because it's, like you said, it's not right. And um, it shouldn't happen in a community like this, especially who cares so much about the beaches out here. Right. Um, but I want to thank you for doing the show again. You're and welcome. it was very nice being back in person again. And hopefully we'll do it again in two weeks. I hope, I hope so. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, COVID numbers are on the oh, rise. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I forgot to mention, I mentioned that, that yeah. really quickly. Yeah. The, the percentages are up there mm-hmm. into double digits and uh, of those tested. And of course, you know, many people are, home testing or self-testing and those don't necessarily get reported. So I don't think that we really have a completely clear picture as to what the actual number, you know, percentages are a positivity, but they're high, uh, very highly transmitted where, you know, we still have some uh, town staff members are out with it and community members right now. Um, The town is, um, has been providing free tests, uh, which you could pick up here at town hall. We ask you, you know, take no more than two tests per person. Uh, we've run out uh, this week, but we should have more in uh, on this Wednesday. Uh, you can also get some free tests via the United States Postal Service. Mm-hmm. I knew, I know that. Right. And some pharmacies as well. Right. So, um, you know, if you're feeling sick, you know, stay away from the rest of the public and, and get yourself tested and uh, isolate if you're positive and uh, I guess the good news is if you're if you're vaccinated and boosted, the likelihood of serious illness is quite low. It knocks you out. It um, makes you feel really sick. Oh, it's got but, a punch, I've heard, yeah. It does have a punch. And, uh, and again, if you're vaccinated, boosted, probably not going to suffer life-threatening. But, uh, 
you know, and if you're not vaccinated, you really should be because, because this could, uh, this could be, you know, significant long-term uh, medical issues from, from getting the disease or even death. So we want everybody to stay safe and healthy. Yeah, of course. So come get your COVID test from town hall. If you need them. We did have that discussion about roundabouts at industrial road and oh, second yeah. house road in Montauk. We have so much to cover today. Um, That's an area that had chronic flooding and it's a really confusing five, dangerous. five even, roads yeah, coming to even walk. Location. Yeah. And so um, PSEG is, is part of uh, correcting the, some of the runoff issues there has offered to pay for raising the roadway up and the town's been working with uh, engineers to design a roundabout there. And uh, so far, you know, the public's been pretty supportive of it. Um, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, I read the Montauk group of concerned citizens or something like that. We're, they're very happy about it. And um, so it was presented at a, at a CAC. CAC, meeting. yeah. So the, you know, Citizens Advisory Committee gave it a thumbs up. Um, you know, there's been some outreach to some of the businesses in the area so that they understand and they were generally supportive and uh, any of the residents that and uh, business owners that need to use that section of mm -hmm. road are well aware of yeah. its chronic flooding issues yeah. and in the winter time can be very hazardous as well because you'll get a sheet of ice forming on top of the floodwaters and it can be a real mess down there even on a good day it's hard to hard to know when you're supposed to go and when you're supposed to wait for the car and it gets a little tricky so, there so one the basic thing about a roundabout is the person in the circle on the roundabout has a right of way. So you, Oh no, I'm saying right now it gets tricky yes. the way it is right now. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. confusing yeah. intersection yeah. for yeah. sure. It's got, you know, five different roads coming into it. So it's very perplexing. Um, well, for Matt Lowndes, I'm Matt Lowndes here at Town Hall for Mr. Van Skorak, the supervisor, and then Jason Nauer in the control room back at LTV. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their night.